Welcome to Discovering. I'm with the Hooks part of Hooks and Hoover Guide Service. We're hitting the water in search of crappies. Pretty fish. Pretty fish. Then we're back in the woods for more wild edibles. And one last tick check with the tick terminator. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land, there is so much to discover. When you're a long-time lover of northern Michigan <laughs> It's a great time of the year to be on the water. So when Captain Jim called and said the crappies were biting, I couldn't pass up the opportunity. So I headed to Chassel for a day of crappie fishing with Jim, his friend Terry, and my buddy Hoover. All you gotta do is reel, no setting the hook. Hey, fish dog. He doesn't care. Simple as pie. And the circle hook catches him right there. it. Pretty fish. Pretty fish. Bucket mouth. All we're using is a little weighted float. Some braided line down to a, a light fluorocarbon leader with a small little circle hook. These hooks I got in Hawaii many years ago. I catch menapachi with them. And they're circle hooks. All you got to do is reel. And all we gotta do is get him to bite. Terry got one going. Oh, double. Oh, shit. Swing and a miss. What's this? Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Bullfrog. With a circle hook, the correct way to tie it is with a loop knot of some sort. And there's several different ways to tie a loop knot. You can look it up on TV um, or YouTube or whatever. And you're basically making a loop, cutting it through and coming back and so it doesn't tighten all the way down to the hook. Put it through the eye of the hook. You make a loop and roll it forward and make the second loop. Put the second loop through the first loop. Put the tag in, in through that loop. Grab a hold of it with your teeth. Slide it down to your fingers. This is actually turning inside of that thing and it allows the thing to free, swing freely. So make the loop. Make the second loop. Put this in here. Go that through here. So there's a little loop right there. Hooking these things. All you do is come up from the bottom. And if you turn the hook sideways when you go in, 90 degrees to the fish's mouth, and go in that way, and then turn it this way, the hole is on the, in the, on the upper lip, and the, both, both lips is sideways because of the barb going through. If you just hook it straight in there, then a lot of times the minnow will be able to spit that easier. You got it. That's a better one. That's a better one. Oh, and I got one down here too. Oh, I lost mine. No, that's not a better one. That's where the hook catches them. Okay, that's where they end up with the circle hook. And they call these probably paper mouths. This, is, this skin here is very, very soft, but the lip itself is strong. So it's unless you catch them like all the way in there, but if it's here, it's got a good grip on it. And so it's designed to turn and go to the corner of the mouth. In the pot. Oh, 
Uh, just a wonderful event. They don't, you know, you get those Aberdeen hooks. They're down in the gull, you know, in the gullet all the time. Panoptic system, which is a new innovation for seeing fish actually move in the water. Um, built this uh, after watching some YouTube videos on on the TV, on YouTube, on the computer, and it's basically a one-inch. Uh, PVC pipe inside of an inch and a half pipe and so this turns so panoptics what it does is it it not only looks down but it also broadcasts this out this way and if I do this it'll switch it'll switch modes but what I'm doing is I'm just lifting it up out of the water there so and it'll it'll go into forward facing rather than down facing this is traditional clear view and side views go to traditional sonar that's what everybody's used to looking at. So this probably is a fish. Could be air bubbles, but there's some red in here. So it, could, it probably is some suspended fish that are below the back of the boat in 10 feet of water. And go to panoptics. It gives it a whole new perspective. That's facing behind the boat now. If we turn it this way, the, we're showing the depth below the boat, it's 10 feet down. As it goes and the bank comes up here, this is at six feet, and this is at four feet, 30 feet away from the boat. We were watching on head-to-head -head fishing. Guys were using this in the Fox River. They mounted, had them out up front, and they'd pan around until they saw a fish that they wanted on the screen and throw to it and actually catch that fish. You could see it was a definite purpose in what they were doing rather than just blind casting. See here the fish right there, the white spot, and I raise them up. So that's what the fish looks like. It's also pick them, picking up my sinker too. So that shows that it's about seven feet out, which is about right from the thing. And it's down about four feet in the water now. And off in the net. on the live wall I had to throw it back in the net. All right, we got a pile of crappies, so we're gonna move along and uh, put out some boards and try for some walleye. Try to run close to shore and see if they're up in there. Okay, we got our planer boards out. We're going to be pulling some crankbaits 
a variety of some things. Some that run shallow, some that run a little deeper. And uh, see if we can't find the fish that are active. Um, the thing about this bay is they could be in two feet of water or they could be in 25 feet of water. So we'll give them a, a variety and then see if we can hone in on them. Lindy, little guy. Comes pre-rigged and this thing acts like a crawler harness, but it also wobbles in the water like a crankbait. So you can run a little bit fast. You can run alongside the crankbaits. We're running at about one eight or so, one nine, and it'll take it all the way up to two and a half mile an hour. And we run them on bottom bounces like that and every once in a while they want that little meat. Little guy. Lindy, little guy. Dogging, eh? That's a good one. Here. The little guy. Oh, there you go. Perfect slot fish. 22 and three quarter. Oh, oh, oh. As our afternoon of fishing came to a close, everyone was satisfied. Jim got to take somebody fishing. Terry got to go fishing. Me, I was heading home to make some pan fried crappie fish tacos. Oh, and Hoover? I think he was right where he wanted to be too. From the water, we'll head for the woods. Morales might be at the top of the spring grocery list, but there's a lot more to shop for in the wild edibles section. So here we are, early summer, late spring, and it is chicken of the woods season. Chicken of the woods, Latiparus sulfaris, also has a cousin known as Latiparus cincinnatus, which is the white chicken. This is the yellow chicken. The white chicken occurs on the root away from the tree. The yellow chicken occurs on the tree itself, sometimes coming from where the root meets the ground, but almost always coming from the stump or on the bar, coming from the trunk rather. This is an oak tree. Uh, it's one of the most common hosts for chicken. It could also occur on various other trees, of course, as well. In particular, it would be on cottonwoods, hickories. If you happen to have a hickory, they're in the southern states referred to as hickory chickens. Uh, and so this mushroom tastes like chicken. And so whether people decided that the bird tastes like this mushroom first or that the mushroom tasted like that bird first remains to be determined, but it very much does taste like chicken, hence the name chicken in the woods. I'm gonna give this guy a gentle pull and we'll go ahead and look at it. The pore surface underneath, you see it's yellow. That's why it's called the yellow pore chicken. It differs from its cousin that grows on the ground called the white pore chicken. Of the two, the white pore is considered to be more delicious, but in this young, beautiful state where it hasn't grown out dramatically and the edges or the margins are curled over, this is gonna be absolutely to die for, right? Uh, one of my favorite things to do with this in the kitchen is actually to make chicken fajitas with it. Uh, and it sounds as wonderful as it is. Just chop it up into what I call fajita strips and pretend like it's real chicken. And it's amazing. This makes a risotto that's out of this world. Um, you can literally substitute it for chicken in any recipe, which is awesome. Uh, it's even great on the grill. I particularly like it in like a fettuccine alfredo and things like that as well. This is considered one of the easier mushrooms to identify. And that's because this is of its vibrant color and there really isn't anything that truly looks like it. You see how massive of this fruiting is and that's kind of indicative i wouldn't be surprised to just see like this little amount or that uh, small amount over here um, this is a really nice what we call rosette happening on top of the stump and it would get quite massive these things can get 50 70 100 plus pounds off of one tree and they generally will occur year after year although sometimes they'll be what we call one and done which is on a live healthy tree they'll appear one time never again tree continues living for 50 100 years never has any issues uh, some foresters will tell you as soon as this appears it's a death sentence for that tree 
In my experience, that's not true at all. Uh, wait and see what happens. And if it does come back year after year and it does kill the tree, well, now you have a wonderful resource in your backyard that's gonna come back multiple times a year. I wouldn't be surprised to find uh, more specimens on this stump about every eight weeks or so. And we've just had a little bit of a warm, dry spell and then a heavy rain and cooler spell. And that's kind of nature's trigger for a lot of different mushrooms. So slugs have co-evolved with mushrooms forever. Many mushrooms like the oyster mushroom actually put off like an alcohol scent that attracts them. The slug comes in the mushroom and it crawls around in it, through it, eating it, everything. And it has that slimy viscous surface. And the whole time it's sitting there, it's getting covered in spores from the mushroom. Then it crawls off through the forest floor. And we've all seen what looks like the slug slime glue which almost looks like a clear layer of glue on the forest floor on leaves etc and basically what's happening is this gluing spores everywhere it's going afterwards so it's spreading it it's doing the mushrooms work in exchange for a good meal and this has been happening right in front of us forever so when you're harvesting this one of the most important things when you break it off or cut it off is to look and see if there are worm holes in here right? If it's old and wormy, you don't want this. It's better off just to leave it there. And you'll see what looks like sawdust underneath these gill or underneath these pores. And that's indicative that there would be worms in there as well. You are going to need a little bit of wash work because bugs love them as much as we do, of course. And this is a perishable food. You really only have maybe a week to 10 days at top end to eat this. Really cool fact. This is the only mushroom this works with. You don't have to cook this first. You can just freeze it all the rest of the mushrooms you cook first and then you freeze this is the one mushroom you can stick right in the freezer and pull back out later and it's just as good as when it went in up to six months when it gets freezer burn and so chicken in the woods go out and uh, check out your woods go out to god's grocery store or the Uper stop and see what's out there waiting for you <laughs>
those different things. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering 